Clerk. Great. Okay, may I please? How's that? Better? All right. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Reverend Fathers, deacons, religious, my brother knights, fellow Catholics. I want to thank you very much for the privilege of being with you here today. Uh, I think this was really a highlight for me so far this year to hear the kind of witness we heard uh, this afternoon especially uh, from His Excellency. I've known His Excellency back when he was bishop there in, in the Archdiocese of Washington and knew the great work firsthand he was doing with Mother Teresa. And frankly, uh, when we hear what he said today, I, I would tell you that if Bishop Curlin called and said, come meet me in Calcutta, I would certainly come, and I think most of us here would too, Your Excellency. I'd like to begin with a story that Pope Benedict used uh, many years before becoming Pope, when as a young theologian, uh, Father Ratzinger wrote a book called Introduction to Christianity. And the story was this, about a circus coming to a small village in Europe. And it begins with a circus parade coming through the town. Everybody comes out to see uh, the different performers, the animals, everything. And the circus is going to begin the next day. So the next morning, the circus is camped outside the village. And the circus clown gets up, and he's putting on his costume, and he's got his face paint on. And he looks over at the horizon, and he sees a ferocious brush fire headed right toward the village. So he runs into the village, and he tries, he starts waking up the villagers, and he's trying to warn them. There's a fire coming. It's going to destroy the village. You have to save yourselves. The villagers think it's part of the circus routine. So they're laughing, they pay no attention to him, and lo and behold, the fire sweeps down into the village, killing the inhabitants, destroying the village. And young Father Ratzinger says, this is precisely the problem of Christianity in our time. The separation between gospel and culture of faith and society has become so great, especially in Europe, that those people who we are supposed to evangelize, that we are supposed to reach out to, that we are supposed to bring the gospel to, don't understand us. They don't recognize us. They no longer appreciate what it is we do or even what we say. And so how is it that we are, as St. Paul tells us, not to be conformed to this world, but still able to reach out, evangelize, witness, and transform the world in a way they can understand and appreciate? <coughs> Father Ratzinger, a few years after writing his book, Introduction to Christianity, gave a series of retreats to college students in his diocese. And he said, you know, the problem today is not really so much the problem of the existence of God. He said, the real problem today in Europe, and I would suggest to you increasingly in the United States, is after 2,000 years of Christianity, what is it that Jesus Christ brings to us that is new? That's the question Father Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, articulated in the 1960s. And I would suggest to you that is a central problem that we face today. And I would also suggest that it is a central challenge that blessed John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis are seeking to address through their pontificates. 
Pope Francis, in his recent apostolic exhortation, wrote, we are called to bear witness to a constantly new way of living in fidelity to the gospel. And Deus Caritas asked Pope Benedict's first encyclical. He said, Christian charity is something different than social work. It is a unique expression of the Christian life. And he said in his second encyclical on hope, he said, people who have Christian hope live differently. And Christian hope is different than the idea of secular progress or optimism. Now, up against these two questions that Father Ratzinger posed for Christians in our time is something else. And that is what a French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, described as the masters of suspicion. He looked at the greatest intellectuals of the 19th century, those intellectuals whose thought most conditioned the 20th century. He selected three. Karl Marx for socialism, Friedrich Nietzsche for existentialism, and Sigmund Freud for psychology. And he said, these great thinkers who so defined the 20th century, a central message of their work was to place Christianity, and particularly the Catholic Church, under suspicion. You remember Karl Marx said, religion, Christianity is the opium of the people. Frederick Nietzsche said that Christianity is a slave religion. And Sigmund Freud called Christianity an infantile delusion. They took it for granted that what Nietzsche had written was true, that God is dead. They no longer debated whether God exists they took it for granted, he did not. And they put Christians under suspicion. If you consider that religion is an opium of the people, therefore what are priests? Drug pushers? If you consider that Christianity is a slave religion, what are priests? human traffickers. If you consider that Christianity is a form of insanity, what are people who promote it? Certainly, if that's your viewpoint about what Christianity is, this is not a type of activity that you promote, that you protect. Instead, it's a kind of activity that you want to marginalize and push out of the center of society. You certainly don't give it a privileged place. Now, if that's your mentality, if that's your psychology, if that's your worldview, then think about how that is reflected in some of the things that's happening to Christianity today in Europe and maybe even in parts of the United States. So what's the answer? How do, we, how do we answer that? Few of us can write books or give speeches or go on television. But all of us, each one of us, can witness to the authenticity of Christianity in our own life. Because what each of these masters of suspicion claim by calling Christianity either a drug or a form of slavery or a form of insanity is that Christians don't understand human nature. They don't understand human freedom. They don't understand human happiness. And if you follow the path of Christianity, you will not have a joyful life. You will not have a fulfilled life. 
You will not have a free life. You will have the reverse. So how do we demonstrate that that's not the case? By writing a book? By writing a letter to the editor? Or do we demonstrate it's not the case by the kind of witness we saw this afternoon on the question of Humanae Vitae? Isn't that the only adequate answer to those who would put Christianity under suspicion in our society? And isn't that an answer that each one of us is called to make and can make in our parish, in our family, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, and in our nation. And isn't that how evangelization progresses within a democracy? It used to be, and we have countries in Europe now, right, just for example in the Ukraine, just celebrating somewhere around, I um, hope there are not too many Ukrainians here, around 900 years of Christianity in the Ukraine, right? Because <coughs> the prince was baptized and the people became Christians. The prince in Poland was baptized, the, Christ the people became Christians. But that's not how it is in a democracy, right? Democracy, evangelization takes place not on a vertical level, on a hierarchical level, but on a horizontal level. It requires the witness and evangelizing efforts of each of us, of each of our families. That's what the new evangelization is all about. We've been hearing about the new evangelization for many years from John Paul II, from Benedict, now from Francis, three great tremendous popes. But what is really new about the new evangelization is not only that we are going back to evangelize societies that have rejected the gospel or are in the process of questioning the gospel, like our own society, but that the new evangelization is not left to the professional evangelists. It requires the work of amateur evangelists, like each one of us. And that's why John Paul II, in his great document on the church in America, the church in the Western Hemisphere, said that the future of the Catholic Church in our hemisphere will, for the most part, depend upon the active work of the Catholic laity. And in his document on the Church in Europe, John Paul II said this. He said, serving the gospel of hope by means of a charity which evangelizes is the commitment and the responsibility of everyone. Whatever the charism and ministry of each individual, charity is the royal road prescribed for all and which all can travel. It is the road upon which the entire church is called to journey in the footsteps of the master. we saw a charity that evangelizes in the life of Mother Teresa. It was so beautifully recounted by Bishop Curl. But we also saw a charity that evangelizes in the witness this afternoon about the charity and generosity of the family and the gospel of life and the transmission of human life. This is at the core of the new evangelization. And this is at the core of what the laity 
and especially laymen are called to do today, to make that authentic Christian witness within families, on the workforce, in community, in the parish. John Paul II said that the first path of the church in our time, the first path, is the family. He spoke often about the family as a domestic church, something we don't speak too much about, but we need to reflect each of us as husbands and fathers about what it means to consider our family, our marriage, a domestic church, a church community, a community of prayer, of service, of charity, of mercy, of forgiveness, of catechesis. Our family is a Eucharistic community. Our family is a Marian community. Our family as a community which together helps lead each other to heaven. A domestic church in which Ephesians 5, what St. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, breathes a reality. Ephesians 5, 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We don't hear much preaching on Ephesians 5 because I think wives being obedient to your husbands may not be the most politically correct message these days. But let's focus on the sentence before that. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And let's focus on the sentence after that. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. John Paul II was asked one day, toward the end of his life, when there was so much speculation, would he retire, would he resign the papacy, when he was so suffering, and he turned to the priest and he said, did Christ come down from the cross? How's that for a job description? Right? That's what we're called to do as husbands and fathers. If we take seriously Ephesians 5, if we take seriously our responsibility, priesthood, in the domestic church, what that calls on us to do, what that calls on us in terms of the witness we make to our wives and our children. Of course, the great example of be not conformed to this world is St. Thomas More among laymen. I think we're all familiar with the great play by Robert Bolt, The Man for All Seasons. One of the great scenes in that play, I think we all have seen it, the Duke of Norfolk comes to Moore, says, Thomas, I don't know about this matter. I'm not sure who's right, but look at all the names who have signed supporting the king. Why don't you come for us, come with us, out of fellowship's sake, and sign? And Moore looks at Norfolk and he says, well, when you go to heaven for following your conscience, and I go to hell for violating mine, will you come with me for fellowship? 
It's a, it's a comical part of the, the play, but it's also a very sad part because Norfolk was Moore's friend. He wanted to help him. He wanted to save him from the tower, save his life. But he didn't understand conscience, and he didn't understand the witness that Moore was making in defense of conscience. You know, we're apt to think about Thomas Moore today as St. Thomas More, one of the most universally revered laymen in the history of the Catholic Church. And we're apt to think of King Henry VIII as he was in his old age, right? The very caricature of a king, morbidly obese, ulcerous leg, gout, unable to walk by himself, dying of syphilis, many historians think. But that's not the Henry that Thomas More knew. The young Henry VIII was the most admired monarch in Europe, the best educated, perhaps the most intelligent, certainly the most athletic and brave and courageous. He was universally admired by his subjects who really didn't like his father very much and saw in Henry VIII the epitome of the King of England that they had not seen since Henry V. And now really, you are going to tell Englishmen that the Pope in Rome was going to tell our King what woman he could marry. And he was going to do it based on a rather arcane interpretation of the book of Leviticus. The king has to have a queen who can give him an heir because England had been torn apart by the War of Roses. Right? The most bloodthirsty war that England has ever fought. The Battle of Towton during the War of Roses, 27,000 Englishmen killed in one day. If you visit the battlefield, there's a small river that runs through the center of it. And at one part of the river, you can see what they call the Bridge of Bodies, where the defeated and retreated Lancastrian army was only able to cross the river by walking on the bodies of their comrades who had drowned moments before a vicious, vicious civil war. Nobody in England wanted that. Henry needed an heir. In the play, where he meets his wife for the last time, and Moore says, I hope you understand what I'm standing for. And his wife says, Thomas, no, I don't. I don't understand. And what's more, when you're gone, I think I'll hate you for it. She was speaking more for the English people than she was for Moore. Talk about, do not be conformed to this age. There's an example of what that means. John Paul II wrote this about conscience. Do not stifle your conscience. Conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of a person, where we are alone with God. Only by listening to the voice of God in your most intimate being and by acting in accordance with its directions will you reach the freedom you yearn for. That is what St. Paul meant when he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Only if we have that renewal can our witness be authentic to the gospel.
I don't know whether St. Ignatius had Thomas More in mind when he wrote his spiritual exercises. But at the end of his spiritual exercises, he has a section entitled Thinking with the Church, Sentire cum Ecclesiae. And St. Ignatius writes this. He says, I should conform my thinking to the church to such an extent that if what I believe to be white, the church tells me is black, I will accept it as black. Now thank God we have a church that doesn't ask us to do that. But if we reflect on this for a moment, is not this so often what the secular world thinks about our church? How often is it that goods, what the secular world calls good, whether it's about marriage, or whether it's about sexuality, or whether it's about abortion, what the secular world calls white, church often calls black. And is that not what they think? That what they see is white, what we should see is white? The church forces us to see as black, when in fact the, the reality is just the opposite of the case? How do we answer that? How do we respond to that? The only persuasive way is by our own personal witness. A couple of weeks from now, I'll be going to Fayetteville because the Knights of Columbus will be establishing a Knights of Columbus assembly at Fort Bragg. And I think many people in North Carolina understand maybe better than some others, the price that so many Americans have paid for our freedom, for what we enjoy in this country. John Adams, I think, said it best. He said, the obligations we owe to our country cease only with our life. I think that is true. But if it is true about our country, how much more is it true about our church? I had the opportunity uh, last year to go to France and meet with a group of Catholic laymen about the situation in France. Uh, they told me at that time that uh, only 4% of Catholics regularly attend Mass in France. I said, well, how do you define regularly? They said, once a month. I said, well, how about those Catholics that attend Mass every Sunday? Oh, that'd be about 1%. Catholic Church lives, doesn't live, in the parish vitality of the parish. In France today, they are giving away many Catholic churches to Muslims to build mosques in what have been Catholic churches for 500 to 1,000 years. Catholic church lives or dies in a country, the parish. That's why the Knights of Columbus have set as a goal to have a Knights of Columbus Council in every single parish in the United States. Because that is going to determine whether our country has a gospel of life in its future or something very much the opposite. We need to have holy priests, bishops, religious, deacons, seminarians, catechists. We must have that. But that will not be decisive for the future of the church in our country. 
What will only be decisive is the commitment the Catholic laymen make to the future of our church. So I would ask you today, and I saw in the book there's some commitments to make. I would ask that one of your commitments today, following this conference, is that you resolve to make one extra effort in your parish, that tomorrow after Mass, you say goodbye to Father, you say good morning to Father, as you walk out of that church, ask him, Father, what can I do to help you? What extra thing can I do to help? I'd love to have every single eligible Catholic man today in this church join the Knights of Columbus. We'd welcome you. If you're not quite there yet, I would ask you that you resolve to make a special contribution with your effort, your time, your commitment to your parish. In a beautiful church like this, it's maybe hard to see because so much is growing in North Carolina. But in those parts of the country where the church is growing, I suggest to you, you have more responsibility rather than less. So I want to thank you all for your witness today in being here, what all of you have already done, what so many of my brother knights have been able to do through a charity that evangelizes, but also to see to it that what has given our church, especially in this country, so much strength, so much dynamism and the opportunity for so much growth is the fact that we have remained for so many years in solidarity between our laymen, our priests, seminarians, and bishops. And as long as the lady are committed to that type of solidarity, Catholic Church will grow. Our future of our country will be a bright future, a future of a gospel of life, one in which we will be proud to pass on to our children, not only our faith, but a culture and a society that reflects the values of that faith. Thank you very much.